Yeah. Brilliant. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much for um, being at the, uh, the New York City premiere of um, American uh, The Bill Hicks Story. Uh, my name is Matt Harlock. Um, I'm one of the directors along with my partner, Paul Thomas. And um, what we uh, wanted to do for you now, if that's okay, is that um, we have a fantastic um, panel of people to come up and talk to you um, a little bit about comedy, a little bit about the experience of being in the film. Um, so if I can um, welcome um, people up to the stage. Um, Jamie, uh, would you like to come up? Jamie Kilstein, please. Um, one of the other couple of comedians here in New York. Grab a chair, my friend. Um, and um, if we have um, Eddie Brill, um, uh, book him for, book him for Letterman. Um, and, uh, Um, Bill's brother, um, Steve Hicks, who we're very fortunate to have here. And we have John Farnetti, um, one of the original Texas Outlaw comics that you've just seen in the film. And um, uh, Keith Oldman um, sends his huge apologies. He was going to be here running the, um, the event for us this evening, but unfortunately um, he's just found out that his um, studio got canned and uh, he's going to have to go and um, uh, find a new space for them to record their show. So we let him off. Um, uh, what I wanted to do, um, if I could, um, was just to uh, maybe start. Um, obviously the film that you've just seen um, is a lot about uh, what it means to be a stand-up comedian um, and what it means um, in terms of sacrifice and in terms of um, choices. Um, so obviously that's something that every comedian has to go through. Um, and we really hope, um, because of the work that we've done in here in New York with um, clubs like Gotham City and with the Upright Citizens Brigade and with Eastville, that we're able to get that word out through the comedic community. They've been really supportive of the film so far. Um, so what I was going to do, if I could, was just start off with um, uh, the, uh, the comedians um, that we have here up on the stage. And I was wondering if I could ask maybe, um, Jamie, um, you've mentioned before that, um, that Bill was someone who... Um, had an influence on you or, or was um, responsible in some ways for um, some of the things you feel about comedy. Maybe you could just tell me a little bit about you know, how you first came to Bill and, and what it meant when, when that happened. Sure. Uh, I feel like... Uh I, I feel like right now it's kind of uh, evidence that Bill was an influence on me because most people in this theater are like, who the fuck's the weird Jewy kid that I've never heard of? Uh, but he was... Yeah, you know, I was thinking about it the other day where Bill inspired me more politically uh, than comedically. Where, you know, when I started comedy, I liked really, really shitty comedians. Uh, I listened to all the comedians on, like, Opie and Anthony and Howard Stern, and I was like, oh, you just have to say rape and AIDS a lot, and you'll get on TV. And then I found Bill, and I saw that he was talking about stuff that mattered. And at the time, I was really apathetic. Uh, I didn't care about politics. I didn't know about politics. I dropped out of high school. And Bill made me want to be more uh, political and, and watching what he could get away with and watching uh, a comedian talk about stuff he, he that he actually cared about uh, and not trying to get on TV and not trying to score an agent, not trying to get, you know, uh, a, a tight five minutes to, 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 to market himself for a sitcom. Uh, he really taught me that you can be brave and that, you know, that stuff really doesn't matter and you can make a career about talking about uh, things you're really passionate about and you know what if, if you don't make it on TV shows if you don't get your own sitcom It doesn't matter because you spent a life uh, being true to yourself, and I think that's what comedy sort of uh, lacking nowadays Well, um, we have a, a, a really um, a, you know well-placed person to um, to answer a, a comment about what comedians are like nowadays, what they're looking for. Um, so um, Eddie Brill um, is somebody who um, not only is the booker um, for Letterman um, and is a, an established comedian in his own right, but um, was also someone that knew Bill uh, very well. Um, so maybe you could um, just you know reflect on, on what Jamie said briefly about what comedians are maybe looking for nowadays. You see a lot of them come through the show and, and, and they're coming to you to try and get on the show. Um, what they're like, and, and then maybe talk a little bit about your personal experience with Bill. Yeah, I think comedy has always been the same from a million years ago, and it's still the same as today. The, like all art, there's this much that's really, really great, this much is mediocre, and this much is shit. And the <laughs> same thing with television or film or paintings or anything in art. And as you uh, start out as an artist, you, uh, as a comedian, I'll just say that, you act like a com another comedian. There's very few people who I've seen in my career who didn't start off, you know, I love George Carlin, and I had all the same rhythms as George Carlin, and as they said in the film, uh, oftentimes comedians act like other comedians. The only person I ever saw not do that ever was Dave Chappelle. The only person who got it right away. 
But every 99.9% .9 of the time, you start out and you grow as a performer, as a person, as you grow as a human being, and the, and what goes on around you. And what I learned from Bill, uh, well, uh, just back, you know, for the Letterman show, when we always look for comedians, we're looking for those one of a kinds. That there's very few people in the world that are you can say they are the artists. Doesn't mean you're not funny. Doesn't mean you're not great. It just is that kind of comedian that you look for. Those one of a kinds. We have like 15 to the most 30 comics a year on, on our television show. And in those spaces, we're looking for those one-of-a-kinds that you look for when you see uh, Cinema Paradiso as a film or some you go, that's the one film that changed my life, or here's the one comedian that's telling the truth. So that's why Bill fit that way. Um, I found a lot of problems in the United States as well, and uh, in 1989, I went to London to go work, and then I realized, oh my God, um, in America, there's so much pandering by comedians to audiences. And in England, they didn't care about anything except being funny. First time I went on stage in England, I was very nervous. And I went up to the MC, uh, the compare, to tell him my intro, which is what we do in the United States. You might have seen Jamie Kilstein on the Conan O'Brien show. Um, he's a uh, regular at this, and he has his own thing. Ladies please and gentlemen, like please like this next comedian from his stuff. So I went up to the MC and I said, um, I've been on this show and this show and this show. And he looked at me like, who the fuck, what is that fucking, that's ridiculous, what? And he walked away and I'm like, huh? So he brings me up, the, the person on before me is playing music and, uh, and the crowd goes nuts. And without even giving the audience a chance to calm down from it, he goes, ladies, I'm Eddie Brill. I was like, holy shit, all right. So luckily I had a good set and I got to work in England and I'll tell you about that. But I went up to the MC a few days later when we came close and I said, what was that bullshit intro about? He says, intro? Why would you say all these things about yourself before you went on stage? Why are you telling the audience how great you are? Just fucking go up and be funny. And I learned so much. It's like, yeah, you know, because in America, oftentimes you'll see a comedian go, hey, let's have a, give yourselves a round of applause for coming out tonight. And you're like, what? <laughs> um, hey, you know, hey, let's hear it for the old people. How many people, let's hear it for the troops. And it's like, fuck you. This is a comedy show. M you make us think, make us laugh. And I never realized till I went to Europe. Well, I knew Bill pretty well. I loved his comedy. I loved how smart he was. And I loved hanging out with him. And he, one day he said to me, he said, you know, Eddie, you're so smart when you hang out with me. But when you go on stage, you do that stupid, hey, love me, love me dance. You know, you just want the audience to love you. And that woke me up and I said, yes, I'm just gonna talk about what I care about. And that's what really changed. And going to England also helped as it helped Bill. The last thing uh, in this part of the thing, I, I've, looked, I've worked in the comedy business for 35 years and they say, what do you think is the thread of all the greatest comedians of all time? Vulnerability is number one. It's like, it's never you suck, it's we suck. George Carlin said that line. Secondly, telling the truth, and the third thing is to be funny. And if you watch this film, you realize Bill really was a champion of all three of those things. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, John, you um, obviously were, were in the film and you were part of the, the group of comedians which in some ways nurtured Bill and, and, and kind of brought him on. He was um, you know, sort of a 15-year-old kid who walked into your, your comedy club um, and um, maybe um, had some ideas but maybe didn't know everything. I mean, what was it, what was it like as a comedian for, for you and, and the other comics in the film, Andy and, and Jimmy? What was it like for them kind of like seeing Bill come into that club and, 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 and what do you think stood out about him? Was there something that people noticed, or, or was it, uh, how could, maybe you can describe that. If, if this answers your question, I was the only one who was uh, married and, and had a child, a family man, and Bill never married, never had a child, but he was still very much a family man. When you talk to him uh, at length in person and listen to him closely on stage, it was very clear how much he, he loved his family. And, and even though he wasn't married or had a kid, he and I came up with the, the three rules where you could have a family, do comedy, and yet maintain your family. And that was, don't go to the club till you put your daughter to bed and read to her. Go home no more than one hour after you get off stage, and don't touch the waitresses. <laughs> and that's how it worked. Just a, just a 
little bit about um, uh, what were Bill's like, um, uh, you know, as a, as a comedian starting out. We, we we touched on it briefly in the film, but but he kind of like came in with with um, you know sort of some influences. Didn't he? Well, when you, you saw in the film when he and Dwight went on the very first time, and they were juniors in high school, it was uh, the spring of 1978. The club had just opened, and I was going down there as an audience member, and I was sitting in the audience when these two 16-year-olds came on. And there was one after the other, and in 1978, no one was any good. And I remember distinctly walking out of that building, thinking about Bill, said, that kid is like Woody Allen. And it, and it just froze me in my spot how he it was, as I said, from head to ankles above everybody else. And I remember uh, two things uh, he said, and funny in 1978, from a teenager. Uh, my girlfriend is so small, she's the stewardess on a paper airplane. <laughs> and I'm in high school, and uh, the cheerleaders wrapped my house with used paper. <laughs> That's what he was like. Um, it's one of those things that um, uh, a lot of people ask about in, in terms of the, the family's involvement. I mean, obviously, um, the film that we've um, all just seen um, was four years in the making, but, um, you know, Bill died in 1994, and, and the family haven't really, really spoken that much um, uh, about Bill kind of in the interim period. Um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about what it was like for you as, as a family member, not only sort of, you know, finding out that Bill had this sort of, uh, you know, career path that, that maybe the family didn't immediately understand, um, and, and kind of how that progressed um, for the family throughout his career, like you, your, your kind of reactions to, to, to how he got, got on. Uh, that's a lot of questions, Matt. I'll try. Uh, you know, there's a story that I told from the very beginning, and it didn't make the final cut here. It was some of my finest work. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, was that when Bill was young, um, you know, when we were brothers, now we were five years apart, but, you know, we, we were brothers and we had a sister, so we sort of ignored her, and then we did our own <laughs> little bonding. You know how that goes. But he would come when he was 9, 10, 11 years old and write, he'd write jokes, and he would slide them under my bedroom door. And I would critique them, and I mean, I had no skill at that, but I would do it anyway because I was the older brother, so I was allowed to do that. And then I'd slide them back under his door. And he credited that throughout his, his early support for what it was that he did, you know. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, but you, I knew I was going to support my brother. And so, uh, so that, that was something very, very early on. And one of, one of the jokes I remember, John, maybe you remember him doing this, but he, it, I think it was, I think he stole a Woody Allen joke, but it was that, uh, I, I, so, so I, I'm not the, I'm, I, I work in an office shuffling paper. If that's, if that skill set's not coming through right now. Um, but but uh, he, uh, but so I, I was breastfed on falsies or something. That was a very, very early joke of his. And I didn't know that was a Woody Allen joke. So I think I gave it an A plus when he slid it under the door, you know. But to hear you say the Woody Allen influence, yeah, I mean, uh, finding out that his, one of his first ones was a, a real Woody Allen joke. Um, you know, throughout his, whole career I would I know I was always very supportive I mean the same times John was talking about I'd go down there to the club it came up in the in the in the film and and I would go get friends and come back because I couldn't believe it I mean Bill was 15 16 years old and uh, was pretty quiet at home he'd come to the dinner table and read books he wouldn't really talk he would just read books he was always reading something and um, little did we know that's what he was developing into and going down there to the comedy club so it was uh i don't know what do i say now where, where, where did i get to so he was 16 which time do we have well we, um, obviously you've just seen the film a lot of which is to do with the family so i guess the second part of my question was um in terms of the family um uh, being involved i mean obviously um there's been a lot of talk about bill and I, i'm just going to ask a question of the audience actually which might help some of the people up here we asked this of all the audiences we've been to can you put your hand up if you consider yourself like a big bill fan Okay, and that's great, thank you. Um, and how many people would say that they were brought tonight, um, you know, with a little bit of an idea of who he was, but maybe that they, they weren't, don't be embarrassed, you can put you. <laughs> that's, that, that's really interesting for us, because obviously one of the things about the film is that we're attempting to try and give people who maybe haven't encountered Bill's work as yet the chance to do that and, and to put his work into a format that allows that to, to be possible. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to ask Steve about was, was obviously the family have, um, you know, heard lots of things about Bill over the years which, you know, you refer to in the film. Like, you know, I heard that the family was fundamentalist Christian. No, you weren't. And so um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about um, the reason for the, the, the family being involved in this particular project and, and um, you know, what the 
the, the sort of the things were that maybe over the years you, you kind of felt were misrepresentations of Bill? Um, yeah, over the years, we, we you know, we were in a very, our family, and it's me and my mother, and then my sister, she wasn't able to be here tonight. And, um, you know, it's sort, of a, it's sort of a weird position to be in because we don't see Bill as any kind of an iconic comedian. He was just our family guy, you know, the brother, the son, the uncle, and all that. And so, we, and we're not in show business, so it was very easy for us to just sort of stay in the background. But over time, as Bill's legacy sort of began to grow and we read things in the paper and in the news and people writing unauthorized books and this, that, and the other, and they weren't always getting it right. And so... Um, um, we get approached all the time, weekly, daily, all the time about people wanting to do things and we always tell them no because they, they seem to have their interest more in mind than really doing something for Bill, which is what our focus is. We, you know, we wrote a little, it's our little business, it's me, my mother, and my sister, and we wrote a little mission statement and the gist of it is we're here to honor Bill's legacy, that's all there is to it. There's nothing else about what we do. So when Matt and Paul came along, the reason we linked up with them was all the conversations were about we think Bill has a story worth telling and that's what we want to do. And it was never about patting their resume or they really wanting to get to this place in their life and all the things that people come to us with. It's more about them than seemingly to do something about Bill. And so us just being humble family people, it's just all about Bill. And if someone doesn't want to approach it that way, then we have no interest in it. So uh, that's how we got involved with this. And my father had passed away four years ago just before they started filming. And it was just me, my mother and sister left and it was like, you know, we're the family, and Bill was a family man, and you know, he got sick, and who did he call? He called the family. When he was too sick to travel, where did he go? He went home to the family. I mean, those were absolutes that were never in doubt, and so that's why we've sort of become involved in this, and it's a great, it's great fun. I mean, what a great opportunity. You know where I get to go Monday morning? Shuffling paper, in box, out box. So to get here to talk and have this many people pretend they're listening is pretty amazing. You know? so, I mean, it's a, great, it's a great ride to be on, and we're honored. So. Something I just realized, when everybody raised their hands, like, ec ecstatically, to say that they were Bill Hicks fans, even though they're in a movie theater to watch a movie about Bill Hicks, everyone was still so excited. And I realized that, you know, maybe the mainstream doesn't know who Bill Hicks is, but for everyone who does know who Bill Hicks is, that's like a hundred of the serfs, like a hundred regular people. And I feel like maybe he didn't not get that mainstream success because... Uh, you know, he wasn't out there enough. Maybe he didn't get it because we were all really protective of, like, this sort of secret that we found. Like, I remember my wife uh, has a bunch of tattoos, too, and she calls her tattoos her douchebag buffer, where anyone who looks at that tattoos and is like, ew, she's like, you're a douchebag, and I don't want to hang out with you. And I feel like Bill Hicks was sort of my douchebag buffer hanging out. We're like, do you guys rush to show everybody your Bill Hicks CDs? No. You only do it at the ones you think are worthy to see your Bill Hicks CDs. And that's how I met my wife. I mean, the first conversation we had, she was like, are you a comedian? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, do you like Bill Hicks? And I was like, what? And she was like, do you like Bill Hicks? I'm like, yeah. She's like, me too. And I'm like, right on. And then we paused and I was like, do you kind of wish Carrot Top would kill himself? She's like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, right on. And then uh, she had a boyfriend and I had a girlfriend. And right after that conversation, we were like, ah, fuck. And, uh, and now we're married. And, 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 but I do think that for everyone who, who likes Hicks, it's not just another CD you're going to burn to everyone. It, it really is something special. And, and maybe, it's, uh, maybe he's the person who got you into comedy. Maybe he's the person that got you into activism. I mean, for me, uh, it, it was absolutely both. And, and it's sad the more comics, you know, every comic I've met, says that Bill Hicks is their hero. And then you watch him on stage, and, and a lot of times it's just really generic stuff. And, and, and there's so much bad in the world right now that, that we do need more artists. You know, it's sad that in order to hear someone criticize the war in Iraq, you have to put on an old Bill Hicks CD and hear him criticize the other war in Iraq and just pretend it's about this war in Iraq. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, there should be more of, of that. But, you know, that's always the case. People say, well, this show is very popular. Well, that means that show is shit. Because the things that are popular are hardly ever great. Um, so when someone says, well, I've, you know, I'm the most popular person in my time slot, I go, well, I want to watch the other shows in this time slot. And, 
you know, Bill Hicks, uh, you know, it's like you want to, rem people don't remember if the, it's important to remember Bill Hicks as it's important to remember Johnny Carson, it's important to remember Jack Parr and Ernie Kovacs, and then Mark Twain, and keep going back and back. All through history, comedy is the stepchild of, of the world, even though everyone loves it and needs it and, and breathes uh, wonderfully from it. Yet, up until last year, there was no Academy of Arts and Sciences for comedy. Uh, there